to examine the midtarsal joint or the midfoot, we can start at the medial or lateral column. Here we're going to start at the lateral column, pointing at the cuboid, the largest bone in the midtarsal joint, is a keystone to the lateral arch and the function of the foot. Make note that it's the only bone that articulates with the calcaneus as well as the forefoot serving as an important link between the rear foot, the midfoot, and the forefoot. Now to assess motion around this joint, we have to consider the axis of rotation that occurs in and around the cuboid. This is the oblique metarsal joint axis. It has a dorsiflexion, abduction component, and a plantar flexion, adduction component, which will be shown here. It's important to find the path of least resistance and therefore that person's unique axis of rotation. An alternative hand placement is to grasp the distal metatarsal. This would involve the tarsal metatarsal joint or the cuboid and fourth and fifth ray. Dorsiflexion abduction here also involves the calcaneal cuboid. So that's the entire lateral column, and here plantar flexion adduction also involves the entire lateral column. Be consistent when you assess from foot to foot. Now in this live case example, let's review the steps. Stabilize the calcaneus firmly. Your moving hand, remember, can grasp either at the distal metatarsal or closer to the cuboid. Moving in the joint plane, or the axis of rotation, the OMJA axis. Find the point of most mobility to ensure you're in this person's unique plane. Now to test the oblique metatarsal joint axis here, invert the rear foot. Test the motion. Should be very little motion available, less than a centimeter or so in a healthy foot. Unhealthy foot or hypermobile foot, you may see more motion. As you pronate or evert the rear foot, this should double, oftentimes even triple the amount of motion available. What's happening here is the rear foot adjusts the position of the axes. So in an inverted position, the axes of the OMJA and LMJA are crossed and therefore locked. And the reverse is true in pronation or eversion. Let's look at this in full speed rear foot is going to, to be inverted or locked. Minimal motion. Notice the calcaneus is not moving at all. Finding the path of most movement, respecting the joint plane, dorsiflexion abduction, plantar flexion adduction. Now moving to the medial side of the foot, we're going to test the longitudinal midtarsal joint axis, or LMJA stabilizing the calcaneus and pivoting the midtarsal joints. Grasping at the cuneiforms or the navicular may alter this a bit, so you want to experiment with that with the patient. Also, make sure when you rotate, you're primarily just pronating and supinating the forearm. Now with the LMJA, a similar setup, you're going to reverse your hands. Your outside hand is going to stabilize the calcaneus. And your inside hand is going to grasp onto the midfoot. So it could be the cuneiforms, the navicular, or perhaps both. Slight adduction or abduction of the forefoot, midfoot. Maybe even slight plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Maybe important so that you can find the path of most motion. Pronate and supinate your forearm. As with the OMJA, we can lock the midtarsal joint axis with inversion. Very little motion should be available. And much more motion available. Again, be sure that this motion is occurring at the midtarsal joint and that you're not moving the forefoot with your palm. Now, as we test the medial column from the talus, through the first metatarsal. Have the patient on long seated position with their leg resting on your thigh, with your inner arm resting on their leg to stabilize. 
and we're going to work our way from the talus through the navicular, medial cuneiform, and first metatarsal. To really isolate the talonavicular joint, it's important to get a good stabilization of the talus. Grasping the calcaneus if your hand's big enough and pinching that onto the talus can help do that. Walk your way down to the navicular with the stabilizing hand and move the medial cuneiform. And down to the tarso metatarsal joint, grasping the medial cuneiform and first metatarsal. We'll cover the MTP joint in a subsequent video. Let's take a look a little bit more closely at the tarso metatarsal joint here, the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal. It's essentially an irregular planar joint. And as we work our way up the medial column, we'll notice it becomes more and more concave on convex. Here at the medial cuneiform and the navicular, notice there is a slight ball and socket shape. which should allow more motion. Here at the talonavicular joint, you'll notice the concave navicular and the convex talus. This has implications for manual therapy. Now on this live patient, be sure to stabilize the talus. You can pinch the sustentaculum tali in order to stabilize the talus if your hand's too small. You can stabilize the calcaneus as necessary. Ensure you're in the joint plane. It's key to find the point of most movement as you work your way down from the talonavicular to the navicular medial cuneiform and then the medial cuneiform first metatarsal. Now we're going to approach this from a slightly different perspective. One landmark that's helpful is the sinus tarsi right there. The Taylor head should pop in and out of that location. So just wiggle the foot back and forth until you feel that to ensure that you are on the Taylor head. Now to stabilize the entire rear foot, if you have a large enough hand, grasp the calcaneus as well. The force is going to be through the web space of your hand as well as your index finger as you glide plantarly and dorsally. Taking up skin slack and making sure that you're in the point of most motion. Now moving your thumb out of the way may be helpful if you want to add a rotary component to this motion. You can combine a translatory and a rotary component as well. Translate. Translate and rotate as is shown here. Translate, rotate. Now walk your hand down. The foot gets more and more narrow. It's easier and easier to grasp. Here as you wrap around the navicular. Attempting to move the medial cuneiform. The same procedure. There's a prominence here which tells you where the base of the metatarsal shaft is and gives you a clue as to where the joint is between the medial cuneiform and the first metatarsal. Wiggle to ensure accessory motion is available there. And repeat the procedure for a more aggressive test or even for a mobilization. Plantar and dorsal. A rotary component, translatory component or a combination thereof. Now let's turn our attention back to the lateral column. The cuboid is key for this. Our handhold will be here as we mobilize the cuboid on the calcaneus and the fourth and fifth ray on the cuboid. 
and the lateral cuneiform and avicular on the cuboid. This little prominence, the base of the metatarsal, and slip onto the cuboid. So for the calcaneo cuboid joint, remember that motion is dorsiflexion, abduction, plantar flexion, adduction. As you stabilize the calcaneus and move the cuboid. Now we're going to maintain this same hand placement as we move around to the fourth and fifth metatarsal. And again, maintaining that same hand placement as you wrap around to the navicular and the lateral cuneiform. It's hard to generate much force, so you may need to have both hands be the moving hand instead of one be a stabilizing hand and one be a moving hand. Be sure to stabilize the calcaneus as you move the cuboid into plantar flexion, adduction. Dorsiflexion, AB, duction. Notice there's very little calcaneal movement. That way you can isolate the force to the calcaneal cuboid joint and not involve the talocrural. That's full speed. Now, to get the fourth and fifth met, moving on a fixed cuboid, just wrap your hand around. Your hand doesn't need to leave the cuboid, your outer hand. If your hand's big enough and you're having a hard time getting access to the fourth or fifth ray, you can switch your hands. Now to finish out the cuboid assessment, we need to move around to the navicular and the lateral cuneiform. Find the point of most movement. Assess and compare side to side. 